First up, we have the Amazing Spider-Man issue 699, and we break the cycle this week. Uh, for the past, I think, three weeks, the first book I've read has been my pick of the week. Uh, we break the cycle. Not to say this isn't a good book, it just isn't my pick of the week. Um, the story this issue, we find out how Dr. Octopus swapped bodies with Peter Parker, and it's told totally from the perspective of Peter Parker now trapped in Dr. Octopus as he's trying to figure out what's happened, how they ended up here. And he finds that like Dr. Octopus can, can access his memories, he can also access Dr. Octopus' memories. So he goes through Dr. Octopus' life, um, you know, which is a completely different life to the life Peter's had. And there's a particularly funny moment with uh, Dr. Octopus and Aunt May that Peter doesn't want to remember. Um, but through this way, he manages to figure out that Dr. Octopus, um, how Dr. Octopus done this. And he got to find out as well that it was his own fault in many ways, that he tried to use Dr. Octopus' technology and it sort of came back on him. So now he's, he's there and he's dying. At the beginning of the issue, he dies. They bring him back. And now he knows why, how Dr. Octopus has done this, but what can he do? How can he get out of this? And so he... He thinks Dr. Octopus must have had a backup plan, and he puts this backup plan into motion, and, and that, that, that's what brings this issue to a close, is he's trying to, to get out and, and find a way to get back to his body. Um, I enjoyed this issue. I thought it was really good. I liked the explanation. I thought that worked really well. Uh, Huberto Ramos is back on art this issue, and I'm not a massive fan of Ramos, but I did really like his art in this issue. Uh, I love this cover. This is one of my two favourite covers this week. Really enjoyed the cover. And the book is really good. Um, I like, you know, the fact that as fanboys, we always, and fangirls, you know, as well, there'll be fangirls out there as well, um, we like to come up with theories of what's going to happen. And that's part of the, the great fun of being a fan, you know, trying to figure out what's going to happen. But re in this, um, I'm really, really not sure what's going to happen. You know, I've got my theories, but I just really don't know. And I'm enjoying not knowing. And I'm, I'm enjoying you know, going along for the ride, and I'm looking forward to see where this book takes us. We've got issue um, 699.1, and then we've got the issue 700 uh, on Boxing Day. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how he's going to finish this run out and how Spider going to get out of this. Um, like I say, the art I really liked. Um, I don't know how much you can see there. It's a dull day here in uh, the UK, so... But yeah, I enjoyed the art, this issue, and... I'm not the biggest uh, Ramos fan, but but yeah, uh, it, 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 it was uh, it did a good job this issue. So yeah, um, so yeah, um, I enjoyed this one, and uh, looking forward to seeing what's going to happen seven hundred, and I'd give this one a thumbs up. Next up we have All New X-Men Issue 3, um, and what I really liked about this issue was, whereas like, first issue we saw, saw Cyclops' group, Wolverine's group, and the original X-Men, second issue it more focused on Wolverine's group and the original X-Men, this issue uh, totally looks at Cyclops' group, which I liked that, I liked the fact that this book isn't just concentrating on the one team, it's like all the X-Men are in this book. Um, we get to go back, we go back 10 days and we see how they broke Emma out, which I like that they went back to that as well. I thought that was good that we went back and got to see how they broke Emma out. Um, Cyclops in this issue, he's very much something we haven't seen before in the other books, that, that he has got a bit of remorse. He, he, he doesn't feel he was in control of the whole uh, Phoenix Force and that the Phoenix Force did corrupt him and the things that he did, he didn't mean to do. Um, and, and this is the first time we've really seen this from Cyclops. In the past, he's, he's pretty much been like the ends justify the means. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about, about this, this sudden change, but he does open up a bit more to Emma and Magneto and express these, these um, you know, that it wasn't his fault and that he wants to make things up. Uh, meanwhile, we also get this glimpse of this new mutant that's developing who can sort of change, kind of like Mystique, they can change to anybody. Um, so we get to see that, and but then we flip back um, a scene between Cyclops and Magneto, and Magneto is really angry because the Phoenix Force seems to have messed up their powers. Um, Cyclops, Emma Frost, and Magneto can't use their powers like before, where Magic Earth seemed better than ever. So you know it's like strange. I'm I'm wondering like in this 
Emma says it's the Phoenix Force, but I'm wondering, could it be something linked to what Beast is going through? Are like all existing mutants going to suffer like a, a remutation of, of sorts or a new mutation? Um, I'm wondering if it, it's that, uh, but but at, in, at the moment they're sort of thinking that the Phoenix Force has stuffed up the powers, but then it's like, well, why isn't magic affected? Um, and the end of the issue, they go to get that mu new mutant and. They run into some familiar faces uh, to sort of bring us to where we want to be for issue four. Um, initially, when I read this book, I was really annoyed. I didn't like it at all. Um, I've loved what they've done with Cyclops since uh, Avengers vs X-Men. Uh, Kieran Gillen's uh, AVX Consequences was fantastic and really fleshed out this character of Cyclops that, you know, he's more militant, that he feels he's got to do the things that others can't, and that that the ends justify the means, that yeah, there are things he regrets about the whole Phoenix, uh, Avengers of the X-Men Phoenix thing, but that the ends justified it all, because what happened, what he said would happen, happened. He, the Phoenix brought the rebirth of the mutant race, and so, you know, and it made Cyclops, I felt, a very interesting character, and there were so many ways they could go with that character, and also what I really liked was like how back in the day you had Xavier Magneto as these two opposite viewpoints, and how for the current generation, Wolverine and Cyclops had become those same figures. They sort of took Xavier and Magneto's place as those figures. Cyclops, the more militant, and Wolverine, the more peaceful coexistence kind of route. And I liked, I liked that a lot. Uh, this issue sort of really starts to undo that as we get to see that Cyclops is suffering guilt. Now, the, the you know when I read it a second time, you know this thought sort of occurred to me. Maybe he just put on a bravado for everyone else. For the, for the people that he really cares about, that he's close with, like Magneto and Emma, that he's been more honest. So there is that possibility, but I still felt this weakened Cyclops as a character, um, the way he was a bit more mopey in this issue. Um, I did not like totally, but, you know, um, I can, uh, on second reading, it didn't bother me as much, so maybe I got my panties in a twist over nothing, I don't know, but... I know first reading, I, I just really turned me off because I've really loved what they've done with Cyclops' character. However, there were some great things in this book. I love the way that their powers aren't working right, so that when they face the original X-Men, it's going to be more of a level playing field because you think Cyclops, the older Cyclops, knows how to use his powers a lot better than the younger version of himself. So this sort of levels the playing field for their eventual conflict. So I like that. I thought that was a nice plot device. Um, I also really like that we got to go back and see how Emma got broken out. Um, I like that they didn't leave that, that we did get that explained. And, you know, where they decide to set up their base, I thought was really clever as well. Uh, Stuart Immonen's art just gets better each issue. Um, he's getting a feel for the characters now and he's doing, a, I'm really enjoying his, his art in this issue. Um... Yeah, and so like, yeah, with the exception of that Cyclops thing, I thought it was a good issue. Um, though, on second reading, it didn't bother me as much. Um, it, it, you know, I'm going to reserve judgment on the thing. Um, I hope they keep Cyclops as an interesting character. Um, and they don't sort of go back to the whole, oh, it wasn't my fault, I never meant this to happen. You know, um, I hope they don't go down that route. Uh, but we'll see. Issue 4 is going to be very interesting to see where they take the book. And also, like, further forwards, you know, it's still a book I'm very intrigued about what's going to happen with this uh, down the road. But um, so far, I'm enjoying it. Didn't enjoy this one as much as the last issue. So I think, you know, because I really didn't like the Cyclops thing, but there was some good stuff in it, I think I'm going to give it a thumbs in the middle. So this week, my pick of the week is Avengers issue one. Uh, this was a book I was a bit um, unsure about. Yeah, Avengers has always been one of my favourite books, um, even as a kid. It was always the book I'd look for in the paper shop uh, when all the American comics came in. It was, was the book that I would like go through the pile to find did they have Avengers or West Coast Avengers in. So when I heard that Hickman was writing it, I was really pleased. I hadn't read um, Fantastic Four but I'd heard good things about it and I'd read Manhattan Projects and so I thought yeah Hickman could do a good job then I heard that he was going to have a big team of like about 18 characters and I was like I wasn't sure about that Avengers has always had a roster 
but there's always been an active roster and an inactive roster where at any one time they'd have anywhere from like six to ten members. And I just was a bit unsure. Like I thought ten members was a lot, but eighteen? I wasn't sure about that. I wasn't sure how that would work out. But as time's gone on, you know, I've got a lot of faith in Hickman, he's a good rider, and if anyone could have a big cast that could work, it's Hickman. And I also sort of thought back to Justice League amount Justice League Unlimited, sorry, the cartoon series where they had that whole big members and I, you'd see different characters each week. And I thought maybe that's, you know, it'd be a better way to explain why different characters are there and which characters aren't there because, well, we don't need them for this mission. So I've, I've kind of, like, come down on that and so forth. I'm definitely going to pick up the first issue to see what it's like. And this was brilliant. It was everything I wanted in an issue one. Um, the story kicks off. We get this, like, kind of montage of the future teasing us with little things we may see in the future and showing us where the story begins and Iron Man, Tony Stark's got an idea you wake Captain America up in the middle of the night and says look, what you were saying about us getting bigger I've got the idea so they go off and do something we then join the story, I think it's a month later and uh, the Avengers, which is the team from the film of Captain America, Hawkeye, uh, Black Widow uh, Iron Man, um, Thor and the Hulk are going to Mars there's a, a green area has developed on Mars with like the plants and everything and they're going to investigate it and they go up against these three new characters uh, there's Abyss there's this robot character whose name I can't recall and there's another character whose name is Latin uh, for something um, X Nil Hilo I think his name is I, I, I don't call it what it was but I think his name is it's a, it's a Latin saying um, and anyway so the Avengers go to back with these and the Avengers get their ass totally kicked. Leaving Captain America to go back to Earth and he has to set in motion what Iron Man had started to set up a month ago uh, to try and, and save the other Avengers. Um, I really enjoyed this issue, I obviously it been my pick of the week. Um, I loved it explained why they're going to have a bigger team and it reminded me a lot of that X-Men story, I think it was called, was it New Genesis or something? where uh, the original team got captured and Cyclops came back and they set up the new team with Wolverine and Colossus and Banshee and Thunderbird and Storm and, and Nightcrawler and all that and they went back and rescued the original uh, X-Men it reminded me a lot of that in the setup for it um, I'm looking forward to finding out more about these villains um, three very intriguing villains oh, you've got like, the one X Nil, Nil Hilo who kind of wants to rebuild Earth the other two both saying Earth needs to be destroyed um, so like yeah, three interesting characters straight off the bat there that, that Hickman has brought in. Um, I'm not completely sure about all the characters that are in the Avengers, but um, I enjoyed this one and I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. The art as well uh, by Jerome Opina was, was great. Um, it's very hickman s inside how you've got these kind of pages. If you've read any kind of Hickman books before, um, you'll, you'll recognise that. Um, I really did love this art. Um, but it was a gorgeous looking book and I think it's Pina's, or Pina's best work um, see here's our, our three, well we say villains but um, we don't know yet, we don't know their motivations, where they're from and why they're doing this yet um, and then this is them engaging them on the moon there's a great picture I love here of uh, when the Avengers get on the moon But yeah, um, and then sort of they all get called together at the end. Uh, but yeah, this was really good. Really enjoyed this. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to issue two, and definitely on board with this book. Uh, so yeah, my pick of the week of a definite thumbs up is Avengers issue one. Next up is Hawkeye issue 5 and this ran very close for my pick of the week as well. Um, I really, I'm really, i really enjoying this series um, and um, though I'm missing David Asia, the regular artist, um, Javier Pulido has done a good job in his absence. Uh, this issue as part 2 of our story, the tape, as there's this tape that has Hawkeye assassinating this president and he needs to get it back as it's on the black market in Mandapur to be sold. So Hawkeye's travelled to Mandapur to get it back. 
but Kate Bishop, uh, he's kind of like his sidekick, has disguised herself as Madame Mask, and kidnapping the real Madame Mask, and has bought the tape, and um, she also has captured Hawkeye. Uh, this issue kicks off, Hawkeye is tied, on, he's on a bed, tied to a chair, and these ninjas attack him, so he ends up having to jump out the window to avoid these ninjas. Uh, at the same time, uh, Kate watches the videotape, sees what's on it, and is shocked, and then she gets rumbled that she's not Madame Mask. So things are looking bad for Kate, and uh, Maria Hill shows up to help Hawkeye out as he's falling to his death. Um, and just as they're making their escape, they rescue Kay, and then they've got to go back to get the tape. Um, I really enjoyed this. This this series has just been a real joy, and um, I never thought I'd enjoy a Hawkeye series as much as I'm enjoying this one. Um, the you know the art still is very a unique look and feel to the book that that makes it stand out from the start. But then there's the story, it's action packed and it's fun, you know, it's just a great light hearted fun, it's nothing too heavy, nothing too deep, it's just great comic book goodness. Uh, I love the way Fraction's writing Hawkeye, you, you've still got that hint of arrogance that he knows he's good at what he does, but at the same time, like Cape says at the end of here, you know, Barton, you're a good man, and he is, he's a really good guy, he always, he's that kind of guy who, if he saw someone in trouble, he couldn't just walk past, he'd have to go and help. And, you know, I like, he made, he's made him a very likeable character, and a character, you know, but at the same time, he's likeable, and he's a good guy, and he's that bit arrogant, but he's also a bit flawed, you know, in, in some of his things he does, his judgments, and I think that makes him a more relatable character. We relate more to people that are, like, flawed, and I think, in many ways, you know, getting off on a tangent here, I think sometimes makes Superman a hard character to kind of, sort of, for people to, end, you know, um, to, to understand because he's a guy who's supposed to be like perfection and I think people more understand someone who's flawed and can empathize with that more than with somebody who's perfect but and I think that's one of the things that he's made Hawkeye a very relatable character um, the stories have been like I say have been fun the art um, I have missed uh, our regular artist but um, that we've kept the colorist so it's been colored the same um, and the art is still good, but, you know, nothing like what we got with David Asia. Um, and I love the, like, minimalistic look of the book. The, the, the short colour palette and, you know, some of the, you know, it's just a really good, good book. That, that just has a real unique feel about it. Um, yeah, all in all, yeah, um, definitely one worth picking up, and uh, it's mainly, you know, and reading in the back, we have Matt Fraction doing the letters page, which was really good, um, and he sort of talks about how, like, pretty much every story is either going to be like a, uh, a one-shot or two-part story, we ain't going to have any real long ones, um, so yeah, but it's a really good book, um, you know, so, and but it's a book, you, you, you know, so that makes it, in a way, you can dip in and out, but the quality is so good every month that, you know, you don't want to dip out, so yeah, I definitely recommend this one and give it a, a definite thumbs up. Next up we have Earth 2, issue 7. Um, I was a bit disappointed with issue 6, um, so I was looking forward to seeing if things could, how things would be in this issue, and thankfully James Robertson is back on form. Um, this issue sort of gives us a bit more of a look to, will t to Earth 2 and to the World Army. We start the story off with the Green Lantern and Hawkeye trying to get him to work with her and the Flash, feeling they could do more good together. But Green Lantern is still grieving for his boyfriend and is very much wants to be a lone wolf, if you will. We then jump to the World Army and General Amir Khan is trying to get Terry Sloan kicked out. He doesn't feel he, he it's the right thing for the World Army to have brought this guy on board who's killed so many. He gets overruled, but he's, he's very clear that he's keeping his eye on Sloan. He sends um, Wesley and the Sandmen to, to this uh, secret base Sloan has got in Paris, and there they find Mr. Terrific. And very much like the, the, the second half of the book is very much... Um, it, it's very much kind of like a spy thriller, as like Sloan and, and, and uh, Khan have been very civil to each other's face, but they're both plotting against each other. 
Um, we also get like nice and good teasers of things that might come up with some of the projects that World Army have been working on and that Sloan's been working on. We get some nice good teasers for the future. Um, all in all, I really enjoyed this issue. I thought it was a, a great step back up. It was really intriguing. Um, I didn't feel it, it was like my pick of the week. It didn't blow me away. But it really sets up future issues well and makes you want to learn more about this world. Um, it's not a regular artist. I can't even pronounce this artist's name. You can see it down the bottom there. Um, usually, uh, it's not a regular artist, but they do a good job. Um, you know, I thought it was... Uh, the art, they did a, a good job on the art in this issue. You know, um, and I'm really liking exploring this world, and I like the way that they've made it very different from um, our regular Earth. Um, you see, there's our glimpse of Mr. Terrific. Um, he's been brainwashed or something, so. They've got to see if they can, can undo it because they really could do with his help uh, in defeating Sloan. But yeah, um, a better issue this one and uh, I'm still enjoying this book and I give it a thumbs up. So next up we have Planet of the Apes, issue Catalysm, issue 4. Uh, last issue we sort of ended on the cliffhanger as the one of the guard, guerrilla guards that had got killed. Oh my, that not killed but been shot. Um, just before he died, he pointed at the ape that had, had, had shot him. So, you know, we was like, oh, is it all going to come out? And it does. It comes out, who's behind all of this? And it suddenly all makes so much sense. So much of that's been happening in the book. Why the apes guarding the city have been, when they see their, their ape, their fellow apes, they've been shooting at them because something's been done to their mind to see so that they see humans and it sort of explains it all and it's really 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 good and it sets up this bigger conspiracy now to like you know who is an ape and who isn't you know uh, the enemy could be within and so it really sets an interesting place to sort of go now it's like cause that sort of Zayas can't really trust anyone because he doesn't know are they really an ape um, we also get our band of, of apes that were sort of um, in, in peril in our, our last two issues um, because apes don't like water they don't like fire so you know to be trapped one side of a river with a fire raging around them is a, is a pretty bad place to be and they do escape and it seemed a bit um, convenient the way that they escaped um, it seemed to wrap up that story nice uh, so it did seem a bit convenient but then again You've got the whole thing that the spell, the, what what was causing the other apes to shoot at them, has been broken now. So it would end easier, though. So uh, it made sense when you can't afford about it. Um, but I'm still loving this book. The art, once again, uh, by Chicherio, Chicherio uh, is brilliant. Uh, how much expression he gets into the apes' faces and how much emotion is fantastic, and how he differentiates against all the apes. Uh, one gripe was there's a death in this issue, but it's sort of very downplayed and it sort of um, happens off panel, which I didn't like. I thought it was a pretty significant death and I I wasn't keen how they handled it, but maybe they're going to come back to that, I don't know. Um, but all in all, yeah, I'm enjoying this series. Um, like I say, the art is, is once again really good. I'm going to be careful which pictures I show you. I hope you can see this alright. Still a bit of a gloomy day here, so my lighting isn't the best um, you know I'm, I'm con constantly amazed by the expression he gets and how he differentiates between a lot of the apes um, uh, I've been careful what pictures I, I'm showing because I don't want to sort of reveal the face of our villain um, but it plays nicely into the films. Um, I really love this this series. If you love the Planet of the Apes series of films, the original films, um, this is certainly one to pick up. Or if you'd like science, good science fiction, this is good to pick up. Uh, but I'm enjoying this one. And now this first arc is kind of finished. I'm looking forward to where they're going to go from here. Uh, but yeah, give it a give that a, a thumbs up. Next up is Animal Man, issue 15, and we continue our Rat World crossover. 
Um, the last issue that our heroes were in peril as they were attacked by Gorilla Grad uh, in New Gorilla City. This issue they're trying to fight back, uh, but they're very outmatched when uh, Frankenstein turns up with his patchwork army to save the day. Uh, they then explain that they're off to, to, to confront uh, Anton Arcane and try and defeat him and rescue Animal Man's daughter. Uh, Frank says it's suicide, you don't want to do it, but they're adamant, so he says, look, you're going to need backup. Uh, there's talk that, that below Metropolis, that there is somebody being held prisoner, and that they've been put there because even Ant Anton Arcane is very afraid of them and doesn't want them too near to him. So then Steel recounts the tale of he and Superman held Metropolis, and Metropolis was the last city to fall, and they were doing well when Superman just mysteriously disappeared. So now they're wondering, is this something that Anton's done? Is it Superman trapped underneath Metropolis? So our heroes go off. We then get a flashback a to a year before to what happened to Buddy's daughter. And we get to see her meet, as we saw last issue, she meets William Arcane. And she sort of very trusting being young. And she goes off with William and that don't end well. We then jump to the, the present where Buddy's having a nightmare, which is very cryptic offering us clues for the future and then they get to Metropolis and they locate where the prisoner is and the, the, the issue ends with the big reveal of who's trapped under Metropolis um, I'm enjoying this you know the last couple of issues my only gripe is that it's very similar to um, the Swamp Thing and uh, to the story running in Swamp Thing and I think they're like it's kind of like the two stories are running parallel to each other and a lot of the same things are happening and I'm just wondering is that by design because so much it's happening so much it's almost got to be by design um, so I'm just wondering is that going to be something significant later on but but once again I'm really the deeper we get into this rock world story the more I'm enjoying it I'm loving to see in this world and sort of learning about how everybody fell and, and, and which towns held out the longest and stuff and, um, and seeing the twisted versions of people, um, I'm enjoying it, and and this was it was great. Uh, the other thing that I really liked is how they use two different artists. You've got the one artist there who does the flashback um, sequences, and then we have we have like the the modern day kind of images that they get to. Metropolis. So yeah, one and all, a good book, a book I'm enjoying. Um, still one of the best books DC are putting out. Uh, Jeff Lemire is just like awesome. Every book I've read of his um, in the New 52, he's just consistently delivered, and he continues to deliver with this book. And I give it a thumbs up. This is my second cover, favourite cover of the week, uh, the Swamp Thing cover for Swamp Thing issue 15. And much like um, Animal Man, this book continues the Rock World story, but from the Green's perspective. Um, and William Arcane, uh, using his dead sea creatures, um, is really kicking the stuff in out of uh, Dead Man and Swamp Thing. And a sacrifice has to be made uh, to allow um, Swamp Thing to get to Gotham. He gets to Gotham looking for Batman, thinking either he can find Batman or something in the back cave that he can use uh, to defeat Anton Arcane and um, he gets there it doesn't turn out quite as he expects which brings us to our cliffhanger we also get a glimpse into the past into what happened to Abigail uh, when she was took to meet her uncle Anton Arcane in his castle and he's trying to get to, to smell those flowers that we saw from the annual that make her forget and she's trying to fight back and trying to escape and we still don't know her ultimate fate yet but again she gets a dream much like Animal Man's been having dreams and you, you think there's something in there it's very cryptic but there's got to be some kind of clue to, to the future in there um, much like with um, Animal Man I'm enjoying this book um, the more I get to see of Rock World the more I enjoy it um, as, as always the art is, is fantastic um, I like how the sort of the panels kind of are very organic and they bleed into each other. Um, very plant-like and um, give it a very unique feel, which um, I, I really like and I think really works well for the book. 
um, very much um, a horror book, some really gruesome uh, imagey, images and um, Scott, Scott Snyder is a very, good, a very good writer but has got a very disturbed mind. Um, but yeah, all in all still a really good book and I'm really enjoying this one and I'm looking forward to seeing how they're going to end this. I keep thinking there's got to be some kind of twist at the end, some kind of timey-wimey thing where they reset everything because, you know, or you know, are they still inside the rat and this is all kind of like an hallucination? Um, I don't know. Um, but there's got to be some kind of twist coming at the end because they've got to reset everything because they've established that this was the regular world um, as we've seen other characters from other New 52 books. So you've got to think that at the end of this story they're going to reset. At the moment I ain't got a clue how that's going to happen but I'm looking very sort of forward to seeing how this one plays out and I'm enjoying Rock World and give it a thumbs up. Next up we have Iron Man issue 3 and this was a book that was really on the bubble for me this month. Um, last issue I didn't enjoy it at all. Um, I thought it was a really weak issue and it was very much I was going to get it for the first story arc and then make a decision whether I was going to keep getting it but I so so did not like issue 2 that it was like if issue 3 didn't improve this book was going to be dropped and the good news is it improved it was a much better issue I'm, the bad news was I don't know if it's a good enough improvement to keep getting it uh, the story Iron Man is still going around trying to track down the people that have bought Extremis and stop it getting into the the world. So he tracks it down to this drug lord in South America, and he goes there. He's now his armor where it used to come out of his body. It now, much like the films, attaches himself to his body, and we get an explanation in why he went back to doing that in this. Um, like obviously we all know it's so it's more in line with the films. Um, but he give, does give an, at least give an explanation why he doesn't have that armor that comes out of his body anymore. He then goes off and this drug lord has hired these three villains to sort of stop Iron Man. So like he's fighting these villains while this drug lord is doing whatever he's doing with Extremis. And then Iron Man sort of, you get this twist at the end where it's not what Iron Man originally thought. And so Iron Man sort of reacts in a slightly different way. Uh, and then the issue kind of ends a bit funny. Um, but all in all, I thought this was much better. The art, which has been a big big point, um, Greg Land still struggles to get any kind of emotional expression that is realistic into the faces. They, they all look very odd. And he can draw pleasant, happy faces, but he, he's not very good at conveying emotion. You know, you look at like Planet of the Apes, which I, I reviewed earlier, and in that book, you've got uh, like he hasn't got much to play with with the face, but he gets so much expression from the eyes that that they're able to convey from the apes a lot of emotion. Um, but that's a trick that Land does not have. For action sequences, they are fantastic. Iron Man looks fantastic in his armor, and the fight sequences are great. But it's just anything with any kind of emotion, which kind of handicaps the writer because the writer has to call it, sort of write around that. Um, the writing this issue is a lot stronger. Um, I like he, he, Gillen seems to have a real handle on Tony Stark's character, and he he gets the right balance between you know seriousness and humor, and he does seem to really get the character. The story, um, I kind of guessed where it was going, but I don't know if that was just because I was really on form or it was predictable. Um, I'm not sure which it is, uh, but it was an improvement on previous issue and the last issue. Um, I'm still in two minds. Um, I've read a preview, a couple of pages of issue four. Uh, the art looks basically the same, but the story, you know, it's the, the story that pulls me in. Um, I think most probably I will stick with this till number five, but I'm not sure if it's going to be one. There's so many good books coming out in the new year that I'm just not sure if this is going to stay on my pull list, you know. And the problem is, it's because it's a twice a month book. I don't know about you, but my expectations are higher. You know, it's basically costing me two books a month to buy this this one book, right? So my expectations are a lot higher because it's a 3.99 book that comes out twice a month. I'm expecting it to be good, 
and you know it's very difficult for a book to be good every issue but you have them higher expectations because you're you're paying that bit more so it has to sort of reach a higher standard than other books which may be unfair but it's how it is um, I'll give you a glimpse at some of the art um, I, did, I did think um, he was improving um, he's getting there somewhere but I don't know uh, but there, there's some cool things to the new armour which I really liked and you know and like I say the battle scenes are all really good um, he does draw a good battle scene and the thing to think about as well is um, the second arc is going to be in space I believe so he probably never have his helmet off so that, that might work better for, for, the, for the artist but yeah um, I enjoyed this one more still think it needs to improve so you know I'd still give it a, a thumbs in the middle So oh, we had the conclusion last week of Silk Spectra, my favourite before Watchmen book, and my second favourite one, Minute Men. Uh, we get the penultimate issue this week, uh, issue five, and this issue we we are in the final days of the Minute Men, and the team's pretty much broken up. Uh, Silk Spectra's got married, Dollar Bill and Silhouette are both dead. Um, so the team's you know narrowing down. Comedians been kicked out of the group. So the group's very much neat wheedling down and it sort of tells the tale of like the Minutes Men's moment of glory, their last great thing. But the thing that they, they hope is going to define them and, and show them as heroes gets hushed up by the American government. Uh, Night Howl then sort of gets back on the case that he and Silhouette and Mothman were working, I think way back in issue two or three, to try and shut down them, them children that were getting kidnapped and try and find out what was happening to them. And Night Owl makes a bit of a shocking discovery and a big um, break in the case and a nice twist. And a twist that's sort of been teased sort of all the way from issue two. Um, but I just really, but it was really, you know, when you get it, you're like, that all makes sense now. Um, yeah, I'm really loving this book. Darwin Cook, perfect person to write it. He's art, he, he does the art and writes it. And the art he does, he's just so evocative, so vintage and evocative at the time that it just really draws you, you in and you feel like you're reading something that is a vintage book uh, but then you know the story as well is just fantastic the characters all seem very real very much like the original Watchmen book and you know I really enjoyed it like I said the art is just he, he uses these like nine nine panels and it's pretty much the same all the way through um, It's very much the same the whole way through. Um, I don't know how much of that you can see. Like I say, it keeps going um, dark and light here, so that affects my lighting. Um, but yeah, it's um, it, it's a really good book. Um, I've been one of my favourite ones, and um, looking forward to see how it concludes when the next issue comes out. But I definitely give Minutemen a thumbs up. And my final review this week is a book that's been out for a while now, uh, The Manhattan Project, issue 7. Um, this is a book that I was reading um, a while back, but I can't recall why. I don't know if it was cash or if I missed the issue, but I stopped getting it. And then the other day I found out the first three issues and I was reading through them and I was like, this is really good. So I managed to get the issues I was missing off eBay and I got this one off uh, from my comic book shop. And i got to say, if this was released this week it would be my pick of the week it's a brilliant brilliant book for those of you that don't know the real life Manhattan Project was set up in during World War Two uh, and it was a collaboration between Canada United Kingdom and America and they got their best scientists together to try and build the atomic bomb uh, to bring the war to an end this book kind of takes that that real life and it's like well what if that was just a front for bigger experiments what if it wasn't the Manhattan, Pro Manhattan Project, it was the Manhattan Projects and that they had all these other stuff that they were doing and what if then all that technology went wrong and that's very much what, what, what if everything went wrong and that's what this book is about 
Uh, this issue, we see them, um, they've got their Soviet social, the Soviet counterparts that were introduced the last issue, I believe, uh, issue 6, uh, Star City. And they're having this meeting with Star City, and they're like, the man projects are like, forget the governments, the biggest threat to Earth are aliens. We've encountered them, we know we need to be ready, we want to work together. And they're like, well, what about your government, what about our government? And they're like, screw the governments, we need to do this. The story is told uh, very much with like a now and then kind of effect where the now is done in colour and the then is, is, is coloured, unique, uniquely coloured to sort of let you know that these are flashback scenes. Um, and it re really works really well as you get more information as the story goes on and um, it was just a really great issue. The, the thing that I really love about this book is a bit of a history buff. I love the history of it. You, if, you know, since reading this book, because I knew nothing of the Manhattan Project when I started reading it, but I've like since I've read up on it, and it's great when like, when you see like that, that so much of this book is based on real life, but then they've sort of twisted it and made it into fiction. For example, you know, in the back we have this uh, brilliant uh, diagram of all our cast, and that character there, Harry, uh, you can see he's like a a, a glowing skull. Well, in real life, he died of like irradiation poison, radiation poisoning, or something like that. So, like in the comic, he's still alive. In real life, he died, but in the comic, it's like that was the official story. Really, he's just become this irradiated skull now, which I love. You know, and it's all kinds of science fiction twists on all the different characters, and you've got the real life people that were there. So, all the people in real life, like Hoppenheimer and Einstein. Um, all the people that, and, and even down to the general who was in charge of it, or General Glover, all of these people that, that were real people, but it took those real people and it sort of twisted it into this twisted reality, which I really love. So you've got the history buff in me that you've got all these bits that are these nods to the history of what happened, but at the same time, the science fiction geek in me is just really in love in the whole scientific kind of twist. And it's just a fantastic book, um, well worth checking out. Um, the, the next few issues are a bit delayed, uh, there's a page in the back here where it sort of says that they're delayed, so um, it's well worth, you can get the trade of the first five issues and it's well worth checking that out, um, as it's a really good book, and then I'm sure you can find issues six and seven uh, easy enough, uh, whether on eBay or in your comic book shop. Uh, you see, there's the art of like the now, and it's set like, it's set in the past because it's set during the war and it's like what if things had gone different you can see there the Hickman style like with Avengers he seems to do that a lot with his books which I like he has his, his, his own style and then here we have the scenes from the past that are like coloured in, in blue and red um, of, of like these two this meeting between the two see there you've got like the past there, there, so there you've got the past there you've got the modern day um, which I really like and you know I really like as well I think it's a really nice touch on the back that you've got like the cast you know all the different characters in case you don't know and it's a great thing to go and google those characters and read about them in real life uh, really interesting because they are based on real life people so yeah all in all a really good book uh, I've waffled on about it a bit a bit but um, I, I really enjoy this book and definitely recommend if you like into your science fiction or your history uh, or you just like a, a wacky book, uh, this is the one to pick up, definite thumbs up, and one worth checking out. Should I stay or should I go? 